Hello and welcome to another edition of C-Squared Podcast. Your host, Curtis, with my co-host, Aliyah, and we are here once again uh, with Andy Dowling, who was originally on the podcast, I think it was last April, March, with me and Corey. Um, he has returned again to speak with us about a multitude of different subjects. Um, I think I mentioned he's in the band Lord, but if, Lord, but if I have not mentioned he's in the band Lord, he's in the band Lord from Australia, not the one from, there was one in North America, I think. Uh, anyways, welcome, Andy. Glad to have you back once again. Thanks for having me back. It's uh, it's familiar surroundings, or almost. Uh, it's not not the three of us from last time, but uh, it's great to be back on the podcast. And it's going to be a good one. So to start it off, Aaliyah always uh, leads the proceedings, so I'm going to pass it over to her. All right. So since it's been a while since we've had you on the podcast, could you maybe give a brief summary of who you are and what you do in the realms of metal, apart from what Curtis already told us? Yeah, so... Um, being in the band Lord, and we've been around for quite a few years now, um, got a fairly fairly strong history in, here in Australia, and we've uh, touched in different parts of the world as well, done a bit of touring. Uh, we're an independent band. We have been for, oh, geez, um, probably 15 plus years. And um, the result of being an independent band, as most people know, is that you end up doing a lot of different things yourself. So um, in the band, I am the, I guess, the PR guy, the marketing guy, the the merchandise guy, the online sales guy, um, pretty much uh, anything that's sort of outside of the uh, initial creative and recording side. Um, and I do play bass every once in a while as well. So I do actually play an instrument, but um, definitely taking on a bit of a band manager role. Um, we we definitely um, have equal say in everything we do, but try to lead a lot of the discussions and point it in the right direction. But I think as a result of that, um, definitely found myself in the independent sort of space, um, talking about um, self-promotion and working as an independent artist. Um, and then I guess another offshoot of that is just uh, doing a fair bit of podcasting over the years as well, which has sort of given me a bit of a platform to talk about these topics as well as a bunch of other things that I find interesting as well. And you work a full-time job to top it off. Yeah, I, I, I'm a mystery man. I, I hide away and do do a boring old job as well in the background. So a lot of, a lot of juggling but uh it keeps me keeps me young um Aaliyah, are you okay if i start off with asking andy something okay cool so um since it's been a while since you've been on um i figured we should probably talk a little bit about sales and stuff like that since i know that's a topic that you do like to uh, speak about um so first thing i guess is where would you say a band should start off if they're trying to sell themselves without coming across as douchebags as we know most bands can do on social media. I want to hear it from you, Andy. Oh, okay. Uh, I know. We, I know we, we've got a hard, hard deadline here with time. I mean, I could, I could talk about this for hours. I know you can. That's why I've started it like that. <laughs> look, you won't be, you won't be short of content from me. Yep. But I think, look, I mean, to keep it really simple, if you're a brand new band, you're starting out, and you don't have much of an online presence, and a lot of people don't know who you are or what you're all about. I think you really have to start small and you have to keep it really simple. It's all about connecting with people and it's not about, you know, the usual things, getting all the views, getting all the likes, getting all the big social media in engagement and interaction. You have to build connection. And it's about, it's like starting off in the playground when you're a kid, you know, you don't try and win over everybody there and try and, you know, be this massive extrovert and, and expect everybody just to, just to jump onto who you are and be best friends with you straight away. You, you find the one person who you think you can identify with, you build a connection and then you slowly build your circle from there. And I think it's a really organic uh, way of approaching it where you be yourself, you know, don't try to be something you're not, don't try to win over everybody in one go. And out of, you know, I think, you know, a human uh, aspect of all this is that, if you're on the outside and you're looking in, you can see that people are having a good time and, and responding really well, then you kind of want to understand what that's all about and you start to get attracted to that. So I think, um, you know, you don't want to come on too hard too quickly. I think keep it really simple, build a connection and slowly uh, sort of expand that audience as you go. I mean, that's a very simplistic way of, of explaining it, but I think that's a good starting point. I agree. Um, so I want to throw it over to Aaliyah because I think Aaliyah is quite good at this as well because she has, uh, you're fucking great at this, dude. Um, <laughs> she's she's managed to base. She she kind of does similar to what you do with Shield of Wings. Takes on the promotion. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't do any of the songwriting. No, 
I play on stage. I do my harmony vocals and screams and stuff, but otherwise I mostly do like all the business side of things. So yeah. yeah so just, just to throw, throw it over to, to her kind of, but also to you at the same time. So Aaliyah, what, what's, what's your take on what Andy said, just out of curiosity, is that similar to what he's, what he's saying, or do you have a different well, sure. way of doing it? Yeah, I think that like, look, when you're ordering your physical CDs and when you're ordering your physical merch, you want to be realistic about the numbers that you're going to sell, you know, don't buy stuff that, like a thousand copies for your first release. And then you're like sitting on a bunch of CDs because CDs aren't even selling like they used to. So yep. you just have to take a lot of factors into consideration when you're doing sales and like, because if you end up ordering way too much merch, then you're going to feel pressured to sell it and yep. you're going to resort to things that aren't like, it's better to take a smaller profit margin and just go easy on yourself. Keep it small. Don't, don't like do the hard sell because it just doesn't work for metalheads really. Like you have to get people converted over to loving your music. You find the people who already are like primed to love your music and you talk to them and you build relationships with them. So here's Great. another question. So Andy, you didn't go very specific on how you come across as non douchebaggy. So let, let, let's get <laughs> let's let's get this because I get a, I get DMs all the time from people, and I don't think they're intended to be douchebaggy, but they're douchebaggy. But reverse, and I hate it. But reversely, I DM people all the time. I don't think I come across as a douche because I get people talking back to me. I so yeah. I don't think so, and they don't tell me to fuck off. So I'm assuming it's fine. Then they keep responding to me. So can you kind of go over the art of how you do this without being an idiot? Because there's also the fake nice, which people can spot from a mile away, which I fucking hate to be. Hi, how are you doing? How are you a kid? I hate all that. Anyways, I'll let you speak, Andy. Well, I think, Curtis, you've got a unique lens over this because you you know all the tactics. You know what people are doing and you know yep. the strategies behind it. So you can you can cut through that a lot quicker than probably your average person. You can. Maybe. You can. Um, I, look. I think one thing just off the top of my head really quickly is that it's all about engagement, but it goes both ways. And yeah. I think it's, it's, it's once again, all these things that we're trying to trying to work out and uh, establish are all human qualities. These are the, these are things that we all, we are all attracted to or repulsed by, and you can't expect something without giving something yourself. And so the ones who do a really good job are the ones who are focused on giving attention to others. So interacting social media engagement. So, um, if you are an artist and you're trying to establish yourself and build your audience, then, you know, if you're on, we'll use Twitter because Twitter is always a fun one. You know, you're getting involved in other people's discussions, you know, you're seeing other topics and you're responding and you're engaging in their posts and you're showing interest. And you might think that's, that's sort of counterintuitive because you're not getting an opportunity to talk about yourself, but people get attracted to somebody who's not coming across too hard and trying to sell something straight away. And if they see that, they're identifying with you and you're finding some common ground, then there's an increased chance that somebody's going to come and go, okay, what's this person all about? And look, 101 to begin with, whenever you're getting established on on the internets in social media land with, you know, being an artist and having products is that you need everything set up. You need a landing page. You need your bios all set up. You need, you know, nice slick photos. Don't have a you know, a sunrise is your profile photo or I don't know, whatever, whatever sort of boomer thing, but you know, don't have yourself nice and clear. And so if people want to discover you, then they can do that on their own accord. And there's no mystery around it because that's all you're selling stuff. You don't have to push that, but make sure it's all there ready to go when somebody wants to dig in deeper. So I think, I think just without sort of throwing too many things out there to begin with, I think you need to be putting yourself out there and engaging with others and showing interest in what other people are doing. As a result, people will come back to you. And then once that you can see that they're responding to you, then you can subtly start to post your own things as well in, in tandem. But um, it is hard. And, and I think there's also an excitement that we all have as, as artists that we think that we're, we're, we're sitting on, on absolute gold and everybody's got to hear it and it's going to change everybody's lives. And, and, you know, if you just give us a chance, you're going to love it, you know, but that's the whole coming on too hard, too quick. And it is very off putting for most people. So you have to sit on your hands a little bit and really play the long game and, and be patient. So Aaliyah, you were going to say something, I'm going to let you go. Yeah. I just want to interject because it's just like building relationships with real people, friendships, 
romantic relationships, whatever, what have you, regardless of the nature of it, you never want to come on too hard, too strong at the, at the beginning, because you never know what their position is going to be and how enthusiastic they're going to be. And you just kind of, you want to match energies with people. Yeah, you know? I agree. So one thing I want to get into, um, one thing I don't like, I agree with everything you say, but there's also people that do it as a tactic for manipulation purposes. Usually it's people that have read How to Win Friends and Influence People, a book I fucking hate. Um, I don't, do you like that book? I, I Just as a beginning, do you I, like that book? I remember, I remember a conversation in the past, uh, Curtis. Now, I, I don't mind it, but I think, yeah. I think it's like anything. If you if you just emulate something without putting your own flair, flair on it, yeah, then it, it doesn't. It looks disingenuous. So it does. I I agree. Why you would be frustrated with that book, Curtis? One hundred percent. Well, it's also yeah. Anyways, I won't get into a big tirade about it, but uh, just just to ask ask. So, because obviously I know you've read a lot of business books because you post about them all the time. You've sent me a business book for Fox Six, um, and I know you've read a lot of self development books. Um, the problem with a lot of them is, like you said, is it does come off as disingenuous when the person is putting it into practice. So I don't think you come across that way in any way, shape or form, or I wouldn't be dealing with you. So how does one, do you feel that one puts personal development and those type of books into practice without coming across as a manipulative douchebag? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Look, I think, I think anything's going to bring out your true colors. You know, it true. doesn't matter what it, what it is, true. you know, um, if your, if your true colors are, uh, that disingenuous approach, you're always expecting things from other people, you're always taking and never giving, then it doesn't matter how many books you read, because if anything, you're only reading it through the lens that you have. So um, for me, and something I've been trying to work on, and it's really tough, is um, sort of my value, my values, um, trying to understand what values mean, um, what the what the definition means, and how, what try to get clear on what they are for me. I, like, there's things that are second nature for me, but trying to identify and get clear on them. And I think once I've started to sort of get a little bit more clear on my values, I realize that the self-development stuff and business books and all these sort of things are just amplifying values that are already pre-existing for me. Um, I've always been somebody who wants to connect with people. I, I get so excited talking to people and building relationships and friendships. I'm not always the best friend in the world, to be honest, like I'm, I'm cause I've got too many. And so I'm, I'm not, not always sort of the, the best friend BBF or whatever, but no, B, BFF, I should say best friend forever. Um, but um, I really enjoy the connection uh, and I love the interaction with people. And so that's why I feel that I've thrived quite well in the role that I played within our band, because I'm just so excited to talk to people. And so these business books and these self-development books have just been extra tools on top of it. But I think ultimately um, any, any tools just going to bring out people's true intentions. And so I think that's probably the defining difference with it. So if you're, if you mean well, then, then you'll act well. The intention always makes a difference. I agree with that. Um, Ali, I'm going to throw it back to you since I haven't let you really talk too much today. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry. What are you talking about? I've talked plenty, but I do want to add to that. Yeah, it's possible for people to come off, even if they have good intentions, it is possible for people to come off wrong. It's not 100% of the time that your intentions will come through purely. And it also depends on who you're talking to. You know, the person you're talking to might be really jaded and might be prone to seeing the worst in people as well. And you can't affect that. No. But I think that that it is 100% true that if you are looking into this, becoming a better salesperson and not simultaneously looking into becoming a better human being, it's gonna, you're not gonna become something that I would participate part particularly enjoy being around. Agreed. I think just really quickly, um, because you know, like like any of these topics, I can talk for hours. Yeah. It, that's it's a really good point that you you just raised because there's two different sort of immediate thoughts as far as good intentions, but poor execution. And one of them is the I'm so excited. Um, you know, I've got to get in your face and you got to pay attention to me because I feel that you're going to really enjoy this. And I like, you're convinced that whatever you've got to sell or promote or whatever, that person's going to love it. And you're not thinking about them. You are, you, 
you're doing it from the best possible place. Like you're thinking, you're thinking well, but you're not thinking of the other person. You, you, it's a, it's a selfish approach, but it's not with bad intentions. So you have to sort of check yourself every, every once in a while when the adrenaline starts to kick in, you're like, Oh, I can't wait to just spam everybody with, uh, with my, with my big news. The other side of it is this is the person with great intentions, but the jaded part, which you highlighted and, and, I'm sure we're connected with very similar people, but there's a number of people that I absolutely love. I've got great connections with, I've known for years, but their posts and the way that they uh, put themselves out there is always with this victim mentality. They're talking about how tough it is and they're pushing this implied guilt onto the audience to get them to engage with them or to buy or to support or to like, or to stream or whatever it might be because of their difficult situation. And it's not because they want people to feel guilty. That's just the byproduct of what they're doing. And I know some people who are really talented, really successful as far as a creative endeavor and built this great brand around them, but their, their tone around how they put themselves out there is just really off-putting. And a couple of them I've either called out publicly in a, you know, in a slightly polite way, but I'll, I've DM'd a few people and just said, Hey, like just a suggestion like maybe just reframe it a little bit, um, but hasn't really been taken on, on board, but it's hard when, I mean, all the stuff that we do, although it's salesy and, you know, we're talking about the business aspect of it, it comes back to our craft and it's emotional. And when it's emotional, you need that extra level of effort and energy put in to keep yourself in check because it can run out of control really quickly. So, um, so it's a good point. One thing I want to bring up, Andy, um, because you said being too enthusiastic can be a problem. Now there's the reverse of it where they're, where the person can put no effort into it. So you got to have that balance. You know what I mean? It's, it's a bit of a care factor. You know, you gotta, is. you gotta, you gotta demonstrate that you, you care enough that you're taking your own thing seriously. So there's some pride and some confidence in what you do. Yeah. It goes right back to, to what was said before about relationships. You know, if you're meeting somebody for the first time, you don't want to sound like you're self-deprecating all, all the time and, and shooting yourself down. True. You don't want to seem too disinterested. You don't want to sound like you're too over-enthusiastic and overly interested in everything that the other person's got to say or, you know, self-promoting yourself. It's, it's, you need all these little things, but they all need to be calmed down and balanced. And it's an art. It's really it hard. Is. And, and if, you're, if you're running high on emotions for whatever reason, in whichever direction that's, that's tough. That's really tough. So all this is human stuff, like human interaction, human behavior, and not everybody's a balanced person, you know, especially in music. Oh God. Like, no, especially in metal, especially (laughs) in metal. That's right. Definitely. Well, okay. So, okay. I think we've gone over this topic enough. So Aaliyah, which one do you want to go on next? Yeah. I think we got a really nice bridge into talking about social media. Um, You mentioned some people having like the victim mentality on social media. So how can people find that balance of being honest and being vulnerable, but not going too far? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, especially if, especially if something's really front of mind and it's heavily focused in your own mind, like it's an emotional thing. It's, It's really hard to sort of, taper that off and find that balance. But I think, I think it's a question you have to ask yourself every time you post, you know, it's like, how do you want people to see you? You know, how do you want, what's the perception you want to put out there? And, you know, a lot of people might sort of respond to that by saying, well, I'll just be myself. Like it should just be myself. I should just be authentic in whichever emotion I'm feeling at that time. I should just be able to put that out there and not be judged for it but that's just not the way life is. People are always going to judge you. Even if, even if you put out the the most balanced, well-approached uh, you know, messages and posts and, and, and things out there, people are always going to judge. Um, but I think you, you have to try and control what you can control. And so I think there's always a time and a place for every single type of post. I think there's definitely a time where, uh, where you can come across and victim is, is not always the right word, but, you can come across where you're, you're telling something, telling a story about, you know, how tough it's been or, or, you know, how you've been disadvantaged because of a situation or whatever, whatever it is, that's fine. Like there's definitely a time and a place for it. 
and there's definitely a time and a place for cold, hard, in your face, spammy promoting. There's times for that as well. And, and everything in between. Um, but I think it's that question where you just, it's that pause where you sort of think, how do I want people to see this? How do I want people to see me as a result of what I'm posting? And is this the right time and the place for it? And even the nuance of the social media platforms, we know that Twitter is, is a different beast to Facebook and to Instagram or to TikTok or whatever it is. And you have to be, you have to be careful about where you do it. And I think people sort of think this is all trivial, superficial stuff, but it, it, the nuance is there. And I, there's some, there's some amazing people that we both, we all three of us know who, who are absolutely fantastic at cultivating and building audiences, but maybe lean a little bit too heavy in one direction from time to time. And they need to reset a little bit because they do come across in too strong in one, one direction. But I think that pause and that question is really important. And one thing I want to add is like, you say, ask the question, how do I want people to see me? If you don't like asking that question, you can also reframe it asking what is the person, who is the person I want to be? Like who, what would the person I want to be say? That's probably a better way, especially if you're not a salesy person. Like, you know, like for me, like I'm always thinking about sales, something about perception and, and, and it's not from a manipulative point of view, but it's very from a, a, a probably a little bit formula, formula, formulatic, if that's not a word, scientific point of view, I guess. Formulate? No? You formulate. Yeah. Well, that'll do. Yeah. Um, whereas I think people who are a little bit more emotionally invested, um, probably that that's a better question to ask themselves, I think. So that's, a, that's a great point. Um, one thing I also do want to, uh, talk about here, just, just to touch briefly on your point there is that, um, it's try not to complain too much on social media and talk about your personal problems and stuff like that, especially because I know like when bands do like, if they start going off how broke the band is and about how everything's terrible, I don't want to support them. I just, even if I was on the verge of bankruptcy and stuff like I wouldn't be talking about that on social media. I just, to me, it's just not the right thing. So Andy, let me, this kind of goes to a point here. So let's say the band is having tough times and you guys need to make sales. You guys need to start getting the income generated and stuff like that. How would you, as the business guy in Lord, uh, jumpstart a social media campaign without going into we're in poverty and we need to uh, pay the bills. Otherwise we're fucked up and we're never going to be touring or anything or making another album again. What would you do? Uh, How do I, how do I communicate every day? (laughs) Yeah, no, I think, no, I think, look, I think there's a, there's a time and a, like anything, there's a time and a place. And yeah. I think being, being transparent and showing some of the true colors of what's going on. I think there's definitely, there's definitely opportunities to do that. Totally. I think, totally. Yeah, I think if you're, so if you're going to talk about something that times are tough, if you're going to talk about that kind of thing, yeah, because I think that you can do that. I think the post or the the content that you put out there needs to be framed with an optimistic approach. I it agree. needs to be talking about, yes, this is the situation, but this is the path ahead. And then yeah. maybe talking about the call to action, like what we need, like, or what we're hoping for, but it's not the hard sell. It's not like you guys got to make or break us. If you don't do this, we're going to fall apart. It's I more or less, we're going to get, I yeah, know me too. We're going to get on with it. We, we're going in this direction. Um, and we'd love to have you guys on board and, and support us and get behind us. And you can talk about where you've been, you know, how tough things have been, but you, it's an optimistic path forward. That's really important because if you just, if it's just all framed in a negative way, then yeah, it is a massive turnoff. Yeah. But I think the other thing like that, you know, for me, like I, you have to, you have to, so, oh, I don't know. It's, it's really hard. It, and it's a case by case scenario with, with every band. And it depends on the situation for me. I'd much rather turn a bad situation into a good situation by trying to um, either gamify uh, a situation that I'm in to, to get uh, crowd engagement. So making something interesting for the, for the audience to engage with. So rather than just the story of what's going on in our neck of the woods, how can I turn this into an opportunity where our audience, our supporters actually in, uh, uh, are having fun with with our situation um that's a really tough thing to do and i mean i can only just talk about like very very quickly um you know i've i've found ourselves in more recent times with a situation where i've got too much stock 
I've got too many CDs. So that, I've that, seen that. That's stretching, we've said before. Yeah. And so one of the, like with our back catalog, we've got lots of releases and we've got leftover stuff from previous releases. And we know what it's like after release Friday on Spotify, give yourselves about six weeks and then your, your release is dead. Yep. You know, unless you're really crafty and you're repurposing and you're pushing it and you've got a great long, long tail campaign, mm -hmm. it's tough. You, know, you get forgotten. So what I did is I created a bingo card system. Um, so the last release in January that we put out, everyone who ordered, um, we sent out bingo cards, a little A6 flyer, full color, both sides. And there was four releases on both sides. You ticked um, what releases you owned and what you didn't. And if you ticked all releases, you sent the picture of the card back in. We sent you an exclusive CD. So I had to print more CDs, which is kind of counterintuitive. But an exclusive CD that's got a song on there in particular, there's about 20 or no, not that many. There's a number of songs on there, but there's one song on there, a Lord song. It's an original that no one else has ever heard. It will never right. be streamed. It'll never be uploaded in anywhere. It's on the CD only. And it's only the people who own these eight releases that get this CD. And nice. we post it. And it could be a situation where I could talk about how hard it is to sell CDs. CDs don't sell anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, times are tough. Or, you know, the, those memes that you see that people talk about, if you buy a t-shirt or a CD, it's the equivalent of, you know, X amount of thousands of streams, yep. you know, guilt tripping people for using Spotify. I could do all that sort of stuff. But instead I just turned around and said, how do I make this more appealing for people to want to buy CDs? So our sales just took a massive tick up. I'm sure. Upwards. It was sure. great. And people enjoyed it and people started getting these CDs and they had something special for themselves. We rewarded them for supporting us. And there were some people that already had all eight CDs. We knew that we we're going to take a hit straight away, but yeah. that was okay because we, we, we offset with all the extra people going, oh, I'm missing two of these CDs. Damn, I want this exclusive bingo prize. And so they were buying the extra stuff that was missing from their collection. So turning this negative into a positive, gamifying it and thinking, okay, well, how do we just make people want to do something rather than sort of guilting them into feeling sorry for us and then throwing us money? Like, you know, we're sitting on the side of the street with a, with a cardboard sign and a hat out going, Oh, yeah. please help us. You know? And you, yeah, and you sold those at full price too. Did you not? Or am I mistaken? Yeah. Yep. Yep. No discounts, nothing. Yep. Just, yep. just explained, um, you know, what's entailed and there's no, there's no hard pressure or, or guilt on anybody. It was just a case of, We've got some, and we didn't even tell them what it was to begin with. We just said it's an exclusive bingo prize. Oh, nice. And it was only once people started to receive it, that word got out. And then that started to accelerate as well. Um, and yeah, and it's just a bit of fun, but that's something that we've tried to do with our band is that everything's, we take, we take our music seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And we've always tried to make, have fun with everything we do. Mm -hmm. Joke, take, um, you know, what we always say here in Australia, take the piss out of ourselves, you know, just take, really make make fun out of ourselves um just to make what we do a bit more attractive and, and appealing for people yeah i love it i love it so that's Aaliyah, a really fun idea yeah I, I wanted to ask Aaliyah too though what do you guys what do you guys do when you got to do something similar to that because i know you have worked out different things have you not no we haven't really done anything unique at this point okay um, I thought you had. or special to to push sales you know the only thing i have ever done is like make a post reminding people about where our stuff is for sale so i'm 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 learning here i'm just Fine. learning i thought you did my mistake okay i'll let you ask the next I couple think questions it's really um i just in passing i wonder how much of this guilt mentality of like trying to sell through guilt is based off of people's childhood traumas but um hopefully we're growing out of that as a as a species ooh, um ooh, ooh, I, do want to, I really I, like the positive yeah, I, want to, I want to point something out. out. Um, I also noticed with the both of you guys that people do tend to buy your guys' stuff after they talk to you guys. Just as yep. an aside, just as an aside, because you guys do not do that guilt thing. That's sorry to interrupt you, Leah, but I just wanted to point that out because that made me think of it, that lots of people will buy Shield of Wing stuff just after talking to you. Same thing with Andy. And you guys don't guilt them. It's just because of having the relationship. Anyways, side note, I'll shut up. A really, really quick comment. I know what it's like. You know, if, if somebody engages with me, it's still, I'm still guilty of it. You know, somebody, somebody interacts with me on social media and is super cool, super nice. They're not pushing anything. Like I always want to be friends with people. I'm always like, Oh, I wish that person was my friend, you know? And, and so that motivates me to, to want to 
get involved with what they do. And sometimes it's because I really love what they do. So it's, I really love their music, but sometimes it's just like, I love this person. I just really want to support them. And yeah, okay. I'll buy a CD or a t-shirt or something like that. And so it's, it's just putting yourself in the other person's shoes. How would I feel? And, and I know that that works for me. So I try to put that out there and it doesn't work for everybody, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it um, on the, on the reverse side as a, as a fan of music and a fan of, a fan of people. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Leah, you want to ask the last couple? You're on mute. I thought I... You're on mute again. <laughs> I double clicked. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think we wanted to talk a little bit. We don't have too much time left, but we want to talk a little bit about PR. Yes. Um, Curtis, do you want to take the lead on this conversation sure. yeah i can do that no worries um so andy is kind of like the pr king he's hired us a couple times to do his pr or once twice i don't remember maybe twice maybe i did something for free i don't fucking know i've done a few things for him he's done some stuff for me i don't know but andy basically has done to my understanding all of lord's pr for like the last hundred years or whatever it is that he's been in the band um so can you kind of go over with people bands bands um how you kind of got yourself involved in doing the PR for Lord and how you kind of got it rolling, even though I'm assuming you had no idea what you were doing at the beginning. And if I've asked you this before, I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. okay. Um, look, I think, I think it's just that enthusiasm of wanting people to know about what you're all about. You know, I was, um, I wasn't somebody who I'm not, I'm not your traditional musician. I'm not like the most skilled musician in the world. I'm not always sitting here crafting and creating new music. Um, I'd love to, but I always, always, um, say that I've got the attention span of a goldfish. Like I can't sit still. Like I'm always, I'm always doing things. And, and, um, that's something that's on my, on my to-do list is to get better at that, that creative side of things. But for me, like, um, you know, handing out flies at shows, like when we first, so without going into a massive history of the band, the band had a name change, um, back uh, towards the end of 2005, and that's kind of when I came into the picture, but there was a, already a long legacy of the band, which started in 1989 um, and had already had a massive following in Australia. So I came in already on a bit of a legacy of the band and, but you know, there was, there was a lot of tension, a lot of different relationships. The band had disbanded those different uh, ex band members, different bands that didn't like the band. And I came in with this, you know, I'm just green. I'm this young guy. I'm really excited. And I was just, always focused on either building or rebuilding relationships with people. So, you know, I was at shows, I was at friends shows, I was at international shows and I, I either got flies in my pocket or just having beers with people and talking to people, getting people to know who I am or, you know, what we're doing in the band, but doing all the things we just spoke about before, not coming on too strong, you know, just, you know, just building friendships and just uh, being a nice, easy, approachable person. And then over time, I just, I, you could see the reaction and you could see the, you know, the efforts are being rewarded with people coming on board and jumping on board and enjoying what we're doing. And I think it sort of manifested from there where you sort of, you know, when it came time that an album was coming out, that you had to work out how the hell people are going to know about what it's all about and, and, and do the call to actions and try and work out ways that you can get people to pay attention and in this ever increasing distracting world that we live in, especially online. So that's kind of where it's all come from. And I think just that innate want to connect with people has been a really important thing for me. So um, that's kind of the evolution of it. And then I've just sort of enjoyed the science behind it and a little bit more of the mechanics behind it. But I think one thing just to really just emphasize really quickly is that I, I do a lot and and I'm and I'm and I'm putting it out there and I'm and I'm especially in Australia trying to work the PR stuff and I've done a little bit of PR for some other bands um some bands that are very close to us um uh, but haven't actively done it in my space I haven't sort of taken on in a professional way yeah that I can't emphasize this enough it doesn't matter how great you think you are or how much you're doing you need PR and that's yeah. why we've gone to you in the past Curtis and had that extra oomph and the extra support um and somebody who does this full time um and has the extra level of professionalism that 
and, and a different lens on the situation and a wider range of connections and, and yeah, contacts and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I think even, even if you're ticking every single box as an independent musician, you should still always invest in having PR come on board, either, either if it's in a particular territory or a global thing, whatever it might be, it's going to be case by case, but um, you definitely need that extra, extra layer of support. Just as a note, Andy does not need that in Australia, period. So I can I can say that without a doubt in my mind. <laughs> um, now, one quick question I do have, I know we're running out of time, is how did you, because I know you joined in, what did you say, 2005 it was, right? Is that right? Yeah. So the band had been going since 1989, and then they were called Dungeon before Dungeon? that, I think. Yeah, okay. So they've been around for a long time. So you just kind of waltzed in and you took over the business side. How did you manage to do that when Tim's been doing this for like, ever well i i didn't really to begin no? with I, okay. just, uh, I just came in as the bass player um and Fair. um i think for me i realized that i was walking into something that was bigger way bigger than me i mean mm -hmm. i i straight away i thought i was i was lucky like and and definitely a bit of imposter syndrome as well i'm thinking when are they going to find out that i'm not like i'm not good enough to be in this band like <laughs> i really oh, they're going to find me out soon you know and and I think over time, and it took a first couple of years, I think in particular, like I really not, I didn't take a backseat. I'm mean, actively involved in the band, but I think Tim did a great job of turning it into or amplifying this um, partnership with all of us. You know, we, we all had equal stakes. And even though he carried a lot of the legacy of the band and even to this day, I mean, you know, the band would be absolutely zero without him he is the biggest creative input in this band he is the arranger he is he is still the face of this band he he is he is the band in some respects and i think a lot of people identify him as such um but he's been very selfless in bringing people in and helping i think he realizes that he needs he needs other people to lift it it's that high tide raises, raises all ships uh saying and so it did take a, a few years to begin with, but as I found my feet and found my confidence, then I started picking up things. And we did, um, the other thing is we did have a manager to begin with as well. Uh -huh. And he was great. He helped us get, um, you know, a lot of international supports and getting different tours and things like that and helped push the releases and build some industry connections as well that we'd lost or didn't have. Um, but once he started to move away from the band for different reasons, um, we were scratching our heads going, what do we do? And I just thought by this stage, I'd already seen what all the other bands were doing. And I'm going, Hey, I can do it better than that band, or I can do it better than that band, or let me give it a go. And I just naturally started to pick, pick up the pieces or fill in the gaps of where our manager had left off. And, and then, so it was never an official sort of thing. Hey, I'm taking over this. It was just yeah. like, everyone goes, oh, Andy, you'll do it, you know? And, yeah. and here I am, I'm still doing it. So yeah. Fair enough. That's kind of interesting. Okay. Aaliyah, do we have any more questions? Well, I think we're about out of time. We are. So, I do think, though, to comment on that um, organic transition, sometimes people can tell when you have an affinity for things, right? And yeah. so you're not you're not just out there saying like, "Dude, I can't do this." Like, you got to have somebody else do it. You're like, "Yeah, I can do this," and then they just keep giving you more and more to do. So it just happens, but it works. And, because... and one final comment, and I probably probably should have emphasized this earlier, is that you know we talk about best practice, social media etiquette, all this kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that you have to be a socially per a social person, or you don't have to be somebody who's constantly active on social media. I mean, what our conversation is framed to the person who takes on that role in the band, because, you know, we've got, we've got guys in our band who aren't that personable, you know, they're great guys and, and, you know, really, really, kind and gentle people and 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 will interact with people if if that opportunity awaits but they're not proactively putting themselves out there and i don't think that anybody should feel that the pressure that they need to act this way online in order to get the results but if you're in a collective in a band you need somebody to take the reins and lead a lot of this if you're not if all four or five of you are all like that then great perfect but you can't all it's not realistic we're not all like that different personalities. And so the different roles need to be identified. If you're a solo artist, whew, different situation, but maybe it's a case that you need to take on those personalities and give yourself space and time that you will be that person at particular times and you'll be the more reserved pe person at, at other times. But um, 
yeah, I think that just to take the pressure off people who go, oh my God, like, how am I going to be like this when I'm not, I'm not naturally that person. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be. I agree. 100%. So to wrap things up, why don't you share a little with us? I know you can't be too detailed, but tell us a little bit about what's coming up for Lord. Yeah. So uh, Curtis asked a really good question before we started recording about um, are we ever going to do original music again? Because we've been doing heaps of covers mm -hmm. over the past uh, few years. So it was a good question and I'm just going to just repeat it. But um, yes, um, we are doing original music. Um, at the moment, we are writing and finishing off dem demoing um, 20 plus songs at the moment. So we've, um, we've gone from one extreme to the other. Uh, so we're get, giving the covers a bit of a rest for the time being. And um, next year we're going to have um, what, what we hope is a pretty big release for us. Um, and it's going to be unique. I don't think it's unique in the sense that no one's ever done it before, but I think it's unique that not a lot of bands do take this approach. And um, it's a lot of work, um, a lot of logistics that are going behind it. And I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen, but next year is the, is the goal. But I think for anybody who's been following us for a long time um, and have been um, real um, supporters and, and love our original music. Um, I reckon they're going to be really excited. Um, and um, that's his me being enthusiastic. Oh, you're going to love what we do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's where I think one really exciting thing coming off the back of, or coming out of COVID, I'm not completely out of COVID, was COVID still around, but mm -hmm. coming out of the darkness of what COVID had been and what it had done to a lot of bands for a band like us that hardly ever plays anymore um, there's never been as much enthusiasm and energy in our band and creative energy. It is insane. And I would never have picked it. I thought that at some at certain points along the way that we would probably be sort of, mm, we're going to start winding down as a band. Um, it's the complete opposite. And we've never been more creative at the moment. And there's just so much stuff happening. So very exciting. Lots of vagueness, lots of vague posting um, in that comment, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Well, pleasure to speak with you this time, Andy. This has been a great conversation. Hopefully you guys listening have learned something helpful from this episode. And until next time, make like a bull and throw those horns up. <laughs>